There's one thing I got to clarify, though, Tom. You said we went home last night and we stayed up to two o'clock anyhow, so we might as well just have stayed here. Does that mean I'm allowed to preach to two o'clock? <laughs> okay, Romans chapter eight and verse number thirty-one. I didn't hear any amen, so we won't preach till two o'clock. All right. I was listening. I didn't hear it, so uh, I can take a hint. Romans eight thirty-one. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We do thank you for the opportunity that we have this evening of of gathering together, of looking at your word, studying it together. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue uh, to dig into your word, to, to delve into it, to learn its truth, that uh, it, would, it would be as it is in truth in our hearts, that it would be the word of God. It would not be just ink on a page. It would not be the words of men written 2,000 years ago. But it would be the living, eternal word of God that effectually will work in us if we'll but believe it. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, we want to continue the series that we've been on. If you have the little flyer that Tom, I don't have one here, but uh, we're, we're going through a progression. Tom said, after the first night, and I explained what we're going to do and go through this progression, Tom said, oh, they all fit together. It looked to me like just four messages that didn't have anything to do with each other. Well, they really do fit together. Um, hopefully, they're going to fit together. And um, the first night... We just took some time to look at right division from the standpoint of the heaven and the earth. That God Almighty, the right division is not teaching that God is confused, that God changed His mind about what He wanted to do, that God really didn't know what He was doing. But it simply teaches that God has one eternal, unending, unswerving uh, purpose. And that purpose involves two different areas. It involves the heaven and it involves the earth. God Almighty intends to reconcile the heaven under His authority and the earth under His authority. Now, understanding that affects various aspects of your life. We saw last night how it affects salvation, how it affects not only what you believe to be saved, and that wasn't really the focus last night, as much as it affects what you expect of God once you are saved. Does God give you a physical salvation in the flesh like He gave to the nation Israel? Or does He give you a spiritual salvation while we look for the redemption of our body? And we saw last night that that is in fact the case. And the overall theme is right division doesn't make a difference. And I hope that last night you could begin to see uh, as we applied it to a specific circumstance that right division does make a difference. Because if you're expecting a physical salvation from harm in this life, if that's the kind of salvation you think you have, you're going to be disappointed. And, you, and, and, you're, and your faith is going to be shaken and you're going to be cast down and you're going to be a discouraged Christian and all the rest. So you need to understand what it is that God gives you at salvation. You need to understand what it is that God has waiting for you out there. And you need to be able to keep the two separate. Now tonight we want to look at how this understanding of the heaven and the earth and God dealing in a physical realm on planet earth and dealing in a spiritual realm in the heavenlies with the body of Christ, how all of that affects your daily walk. When you get up and you get dressed in the morning and you go out into this world, what does that mean to you? We know that God's going to reconcile the heaven and the earth. We know that He's going to bring it all back under His dominion and under His authority. But listen... When you're working a 9 to 5 job or a 9 to 7 job or a 9 to 9 job or ever how long you have to work to make enough money to live and uh, you know the, and you get home and the kids are screaming and supper's not on the table and this is going wrong and that's going wrong and the car broke down and what, how does all that affect your life? See all that's kind of out there floating somewhere that God's doing all this but then we get caught up in ho hum humdrum everyday existence. We get caught up in how to pay the bills, in how to do this, how to figure this out, how we're going to get this done, how, we, and all of the rest kind of gets pushed aside. Well, there is truth in this understanding of the heaven and the earth, and God dealing in the physical and dealing in the spiritual, that will help you in your daily life to have some stability. The one thing, if I had to, to try to identify the one thing in the lives of believers today that's a problem, it's a lack of stability. Believers are up here one day and down here the next day, and way over here the next day, and way over there the next day, and up here and down here. And if you watch Christian television very much, you see it. You've seen Christian talk shows. And man, one minute, they're just sailing to glory, praising the Lord. 
ever, ever based upon the performance of your flesh. It's based upon the performance of Jesus Christ at Calvary. That's all God looks at. That's all God sees. That's the only issue. And you're in Him. You understand that? You're all saying, yeah. But I know some of you are going to go out of here. When you sin, do you think God's upset with you? Do you feel guilty? When you do good, do you get the feeling that God is particularly happy with you that day? <laughs> Isn't that basing your acceptance before God upon your performance? If I performed a certain way today, God is happy. If I didn't make the mark, God is displeased. I've been a bad boy. Get that thinking out of your head. That's the law. Any system that encourages you to analyze your actions and your flesh is the law. Any system that says, keep short accounts with God. Any system that says, catalog your sins. Any system that says, don't go to bed until you have confessed all your sins, because if you die with unconfessed sin, oh my... That's the law. Your acceptance is not based upon any of that. Your acceptance is based upon the fact that 2,000 years ago on Calvary, Jesus Christ took all your sins and paid the ultimate penalty for them. And by faith, you've been made a part of it. And that's all your acceptance is based on. That's all. God is not evaluating in this life today the performance of your flesh song say says first he sees Jesus then he sees me in the beloved accepted and free accepted acceptance see Israel's acceptance was based on making their flesh perform in a certain way our acceptance is based on a performance that's already done and that has already been declared perfect Amen. by God. Now listen. You know what that means? Now listen to what this means. And understand this. That means... Go to Ephesians 3. 1, I'm sorry. Ephesians 1. And get Romans 8. And Romans 5. Right? Ephesians 1. Romans 8. Romans 5. <coughs> I almost forgot about the old woman. We've got to get to her at the end, too. Ephesians 1, Romans 8, Romans 5. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he goes down through and he lists those blessings. We talked about them last night. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. God's attitude towards you is absolute peace. No wrath, no judgment, no chastening. Romans chapter 8, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You know what he says there? If God says you're righteous, who's going to stand up and argue with him about it? Think about it. If Jesus Christ stood right here behind this pulpit tonight, and he pointed to Brother Rose over there, since he's the only one that knew where we were in Leviticus. <laughs> said, that is a righteous man. Now this is God Almighty that spoke the universe into existence as easy as you let the dog out in the morning. And he says, that man is righteous. And if you want to stand up and say, no, he's not. I saw him last week. I saw what he was doing. <laughs> oh yeah, that little devil. Yeah. No. 
next minute they're all sitting around crying with each other. And they're just up and down and up and... You know, that's, and that's kind of the way Christianity is. Because that's kind of the way Christians are. But Paul says, let your moderation be known to all men. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul gives you the impression that, that, that your Christian life is not to be like this, but it's to be like this. See, in medicine, a straight line is a sign of death. But in spiritual things, a straight line is a sign of life. It means there's life working in you, and it's consistent, and it's stable, and it just goes on. And we're going to look tonight at how you can have that. How you can, how you can do that by kicking the old woman out. All right? So, let's go. Um, go with me over to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And some of you probably already have figured out what that title means. Um, if you haven't, well, stay tuned. We'll get there. That's about 1.30 this morning. We'll get to that because that will be right at the end. All right? <laughs> Exodus chapter 19, verse number 3. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, uh, and, a, and a holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God sets aside the nation Israel and He establishes for them a covenant. And that covenant that He establishes for them is a performance-based covenant. God establishes true, uh, a, a situation with the nation Israel where His acceptance of them and His blessing of them and His dealing with them is based upon their performance in the flesh. Remember that we saw yesterday how that God gave Israel salvation in the flesh right before this passage here in Exodus 19 is where he said to them, stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. A salvation that you can see in the flesh, that you can touch, that you can know is there. And then he brings them out by a strong and mighty hand and he says, I'm going to make an agreement with you, Israel, a covenant that is based upon the performance of your flesh, that is based on how well you can keep your body under control, that is based on how well you can, you can do the things that I tell you to do. Look in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 6 verse number 20. <clears throat> Excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 20. And look at what God says here. And, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. The Lord brought us out of Egypt by a mighty hand. See, he ties it into that physical salvation out of Egypt. And the Lord showed us signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all our household before our what? eyes. You see how he's dealing with Israel always in the physical and what they can see and what they can experience? And he goes on in verse number 23, And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in and give us a land which he sware unto our fathers. There's the issue of that physical land. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. Now look at verse 25. And it shall be our... What? Righteousness. And what's the next word? If. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as He hath commanded us. It's real simple. Moses calls the children of Israel out and he says, You want to be righteous before the Lord your God? Here's statutes, here's commandments, here's ordinances. And it will be your righteousness if you perform those things. If you, with your, if you can perform in the flesh... The way God requires, he'll, 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 he'll accept you because it'll be your righteousness. Look in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 10. Deuteronomy 24, 10. <clears throat> uh, chapter 24, verse 10. Let's, let's save time. Skip down to verse 13. He's talking about a specific commandment in the law here concerning borrowing uh, or lending to a brother. And he says in Deuteronomy 24, 13, In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee, and it shall be... 
God says you're righteous, who is He the condemner? And that puts you in a position of blessing and never cursing. God's attitude toward you is one of absolute blessing. He accepts you and He blesses you based upon that acceptance in Christ. Period. When something bad comes into your life, it's not because God's mad at you. If God is for us, who can be? God is never against you. He's always for you. God never curses you. He has already blessed you in Christ. You know what? That makes that last thing down there a little little, uh, unnecessary, doesn't it? I don't think you need that. What Paul puts in replacement of that, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, there is something that Paul asks you to do. In Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. He says, Renew your mind. And you know what that involves? That involves thinking about yourself the way God thinks about you. How does God think about you? He's satisfied. He's blessed you. Is that the way you think about yourself? Well, guilt is not one of those renewed mind feelings. Envy is not one of those renewed mind feelings. Jealousy is not one of those renewed mind feelings. Self-righteousness is not a renewed mind feeling. None of those things are from the renewed mind. It means you're not thinking about yourself the way God thinks about you. And we do it in two ways. We put ourselves down and we pick ourselves up. And that's why you have believers that are way up here one day and way down here the next day. Because one day when they think God is happy with them, they're way up here sailing along on cloud nine. And the next day when they think God's mad at them, they're down here crawling under the carpet looking for a hole somewhere. And it makes your Christian life just like this. Because you're not thinking about yourself the way God thinks about you. And the way God thinks about you never changes. You know the verse we started out with? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. Well, if Christ never changes, then the way God thinks about Him never changes. And if you're in Christ, and Christ is in you, then the way God thinks about you never changes. And you see how I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Because no matter what's going on around me, I know what God thinks about me. And I can be content with it. And Paul, look in Galatians 4. Look in Galatians chapter 4. We'll get rid of this old woman. (coughs) Verse 19. My little children, (coughs) of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in... What's Paul's goal? To form Christ in them again. That doesn't mean they're getting saved again. That means at one point... They were thinking about themselves the way God does. And they're viewing their life based upon the life of Christ that lives in them. And they got off of that. And they got out thinking about themselves the way the world is. And some guy came in and said, Oh, no, no, God hasn't accepted you lest you be circumcised. They said, Oh, you mean I've got to do something with my flesh? See? And Paul says, I want Christ to be... I want you to think about yourself the way God does again. I want Christ, the life of Christ, to be the issue. And he gives them an example. Verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Paul's serious. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he who of the free woman was of promise. Which two things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth bondage, which is a 
righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. See how the law keeps saying, if you do this thing, it will be righteousness unto you. If you perform this way, I'll count it as righteousness unto you. It will be your, you do this thing, you perform this way, I'll look at that performance in the flesh and I'll say it's righteous and I'll accept you because you've performed. 27th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 26. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to what? To do them. All the people shall say amen. See, the issue of the law was in the doing of the thing. It will be your righteousness if you do them. You see, God required from the nation Israel for acceptance in order for Him to accept them, in order for Him to bless them, in order for Him to be in right relationship with them. He required a physical, fleshly, visible performance and demonstration. They had to see it. Go over to Galatians chapter 3. That's the curse of the law. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 10, Paul says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So the curse of the law is in the doing of the thing. Now, understand what that means. If, If I were to say to you, See, in one way, the law was good for Israel. In fact, the law was holy and just and good. And it was good to them in that they knew what God wanted done. The Gentiles are out there in the, in the ignorance of their own lusts and just wandering around, and they don't know what in the world's going on. They had no idea how to be accepted by God. But God comes to Israel and He says, Now, here's what you need to do to be accepted by Me. So that's good. It would be like, If I said, Marvin, all you have to do to be accepted by God is come right up here on this platform, stand right up here in the front of this platform, bend right down and grab your ankles and pick yourself up in midair and just hang here in front of all of us for 10 minutes. And if you do that, God will accept you. Well, now, Marvin's thinking, well, now I know what I need to do, but I can't do it. So it's good, but it's bad. It's a blessing, but it's a curse. And that's what happens with Israel under the law. They know what God requires, but the curse of the law is in the doing of the thing. Because the law... Whoops, forgot my pen. I'll be back. Because the law is a performance system. And the acceptance under the law is based upon performance. It's based upon your performance in the flesh. Remember, God deals with Israel in the flesh. All of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. That's His relationship to them. We studied that last night. And the performance of their flesh is the issue. And it becomes if, then. If you perform, then you'll get the blessing. Now look over in Leviticus 26. Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1. And get Deuteronomy 28. These two passages, in fact we looked briefly at Deuteronomy 28 last night. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. God puts some teeth into that thing. And He says, (coughs) He has already said, If you obey Me, I'll accept you. And if you don't, I won't. And just to show you that I mean business... If you obey me, if your flesh conforms to what I want it to be, then I'm going to do some things for it. But if you don't, I'm going to do some things against it. Leviticus 26, um, oh, I want to read it all. Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then will I give you rain in due season? And the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. Ye shall dwell. 
For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she that hath an husband. But we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You know the account. We're going to look at it, but time's gone. You know what happened back there with Abraham. God gave him a promise of a son through Sarah, his wife. And Abraham and Sarah, they cooked up this little scheme whereby they were going to produce with their own flesh what God needed. They're going to do it. They're going to perform. See, God had already accepted them and said, I'm going to give you a son, I'm going to bless you. But they weren't thinking about things the way God told them to think about things, were they? So they went out and they said, we're going to perform. So Abraham went in unto Hagar and produced a child, Ishmael. And the verse says, Abraham says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Oh, Lord, that the works of my flesh might be the basis of your acceptance of me. Isn't that what we do? Oh, Lord, I did so good today. Surely you're pleased with me. Or we turn it around. And when we don't perform the way we should... We say, oh, God must be so disappointed in me. And that's Hagar and Abraham and the child they produced. And you know what God says? Get rid of it! Don't ever think that your flesh will be accepted by me. Realize that I crucified your flesh and I accepted my son and I put you in him and that's the only issue. That's the only issue. Does right division matter? If you want any kind of stability in your life as a believer, it matters. Because as long as you are evaluating yourself based upon the performance of your flesh, And as long as you think that God is evaluating you based on the performance of your flesh, you're going to have a life as a believer that is absolute discouragement, disappointment, and failure. And until you start to renew your mind and think about yourself the way God thinks about you, that's going to be the case. Paul says, kick the old woman out. Get rid of the law. Don't evaluate your flesh based upon the law of Moses or any other arbitrary law system that you or some of your friends want to put you under. But evaluate yourself based upon the fact that God loved you, Christ died for you, and the Holy Spirit sealed you to the day of redemption, secure in Christ. And that affects how you view the things that come into your life. When things are going bad, you're not running around saying, Oh, God's getting me for a... Oh, I knew He'd see me do that. I knew, I knew, I knew. It takes care of all of that stuff. It allows you to face the trials and tribulations of this world for just what they are. A fallen creation, groaning and travailing. And it allows you to know that you've got something beyond all of that. Acceptance by God in Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank You for the acceptance that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank You that You've got nothing against us. That You're at peace with us. That there is no wrath. That there is no chastening. That there is only the super abounding blessing that You've poured out on us in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we might just in our lives look at ourselves the way you do and evaluate ourselves based upon the fact that we're in Christ accepted in him and we thank you for it all
your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the, uh, the sword go through your land. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. So God gives Israel there some definite things that He's going to bless them with as long as they conform. Look in Deuteronomy 28. Keep your hand here in Leviticus. Look in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all His commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou will hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And you go through and you read the next 13 or 14 verses, and you see all the blessings that come on the nation Israel. But both of those chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, have a second half. And in Leviticus 26, the second half of the chapter begins at verse 14. And the second half is, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgment, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague, and shall consume your eyes, and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And verse 18, And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 21, And if ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plague upon you according to your sins. Verse 24, Then will I also walk contrary to you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. God goes through these cycles of judgment with the nation Israel. He says, if you get out of line, if you don't perform the way I've told you you need to perform, I'm going to do this to you. And if you still don't listen, I'm going to do this to you. And if you still don't, I'm going to do this to you. And if you still don't, I'm going to do this to you. God lays out for the nation Israel exactly what's going to come upon them if they don't obey. If they don't fulfill that if part of the law, if they don't perform the way God says, there's going to be hell to pay, we'd say today. They're going to have trouble. Deuteronomy 28, look over there, verse 15. It shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his statute, uh, commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city. Cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. And he goes on down all the way through the rest of chapter number 28. He talks about all the curses that will come upon the nation Israel. So the nation Israel lives under this performance system. I understand for a while here it's kind of hard to see how this has anything to do with heaven and earth and all the rest. But we'll get there at the end, all right? They live under this performance system. And he's dealing with them based upon the performance of their flesh. Based upon what's visible, based upon what they can see. He puts them under an if-then system. He says, based upon your performance up here, I'm going to bless you, <coughs> excuse me, or I'm going to curse you. I'll either bring great blessing on you for obedience, or I'll bring great curse upon you for disobedience. I'll either make your fields to bear all kinds of fruit when you obey, or I'll just wipe out your crops altogether when you disobey. I'll either bring your enemies in to defeat you when you disobey, or I'll send your enemies to flight before you when you obey. So he always is, is drawing this contrast. He's always giving Israel the option. You can obey me, and you can have uh, the blessing, or you can disobey me, and you can have the curse. Now, when God sets up this system, along with that system, there went a sacrificial system that allowed them, if they're over here getting cursed, and they want to get back in the blessing part, okay? They get way out here, and they're in about that third or fourth cycle of curse, and they want to get back into the blessing. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> They want to get back into the blessing. I was walking off into the woods there. They want to get, get out of the curse and get back into the blessing. People listening on the audio tape aren't going to have any idea what I just did, are they? Well, you folks in the audio tape, there's a tree up here on the platform. And I just about fell over it, all right? So that's what's going on. I just want to keep everybody informed. All right, back to important stuff now. If they're out there in the curse and they want to get in blessing again, God gives them a system whereby they can do that. 
in his name. Amen. It's the sacrificial system of the law. Look over in Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. We'll look at two passages here. He gives uh, In Leviticus chapter 1, we see the description uh, for uh, an individual in the nation that would bring a sacrifice unto the Lord. Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 1, And the Lord called upon Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the <coughs> children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. God Almighty provided a way for a Jew in the nation Israel that has sinned to bring that offering of his own voluntary will to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lay his hand upon it. The sin in God's eyes would be transferred unto that animal. The animal would die. The sin would be atoned for. And God would not pour out the curse that was to come upon the nation. Or if they were in a cursed situation and, and they brought that sacrifice, then he would begin to bless. Over Leviticus 16, you see the same principle this time carried out by the high priest on behalf of the entire nation. Uh, verse 11, Aaron shall bring the bullock, Leviticus 16, 11, of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar of the Lord, and it's with hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it uh, with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood of his finger seven times. <coughs> Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now, God lays out a system for Israel. Israel, I know you're a stiff-necked and uncircumcised people. And I know you're not always going to do what I've told you to do. And I know you're going to get in trouble. And I know you're going to end up getting cursed. And here's a system whereby those sins that you're going to commit and those violations of the law can be dealt with. And here's the way it is. Number one, there's an individual sacrifice. If an individual sins, you can go offer the sacrifice. I'll accept it. If the nation has gone out into sin and I'm bringing judgment on the nation... There, there, there's a, a sacrificial system for the nation set up. And if you simply by faith trust that sacrifice that's going on there uh, on the Day of Atonement, I'll heal your nation. I'll forgive your nation. In fact, go to Second Chronicles. That's a verse we need to look at. Second Chronicles chapter 7. We need to look at it because it fits in here real good. And we also need to look at it because it's my pet peeve verse. All right? You all have a pet peeve verse, don't you? The one that all the television preachers mess up so bad. And, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I know better than that guy. You know? And he's preaching to 50 billion people or whatever. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by, my, by name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And you hear preacher after preacher say, well, you see, that's what the United States needs to do. The United States got this terrible sin of abortion. And what we need to do is repent of that and repent of our homosexuality and repent of putting these rotten guys in government positions. And we need to turn back to the Lord and we need to fall upon our face before Him and we need to worship Him. And we need to repent of our sins and we need to come back to Him and then He'll greatly bless the United States. That's what they say. And that's not what that verse says, is it? Because, you know... The first requirement is in verse 13, where it says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. God has to, first of all, be dealing with the people in some wrath and chastening. He's got to be sending out the curse of the law. 
And if the condition is that you're under the curse of the law, Israel, then there's a way that you can get out from under that curse. And the way you get out from under that curse, listen to this verse. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What's that sound like? Does that sound like Exodus 19? See, we wrote if, I even wrote it on the board for you. Right there in blue and white. If then. And it's right here again in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If you perform this way, Israel, you get out there and sin and you've been not performing right, and what you need to do is perform a specific way so that you can get back into the blessing so you can begin to try again to perform the way you should have been performing in the first place, which got you out there under the curse. Perform, Israel. Do it the way I tell you. Not only that, you know where he had to do this thing? Verse 15. You know what? What's going on here is the dedication of the temple. And verse 15, he says, Now my eyes shall be open, and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house, and my na- that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. If you want to do verse 14, you got to go to where verse 15 says it's going to happen. And that's that temple. Where where is that temple today? Well, they say it's under about 100 feet of sand, I guess. I don't know. It's over there, say, keep looking for it. Keep thinking they know where it was and going to dig it up and all that stuff. but, But I don't think you could go there and pray. And is the glory of the Lord in that temple over there now? Even if you could find it? Is God dwelling between the cherubs? We saw last night how Hezekiah went in and prayed, Oh, Lord that dwelleth between the cherubs. Well, I saw we're... You know the chorus, Christ liveth where? In me. We're going to look at that later on. God's not dwelling between the cherubs anymore. And God's not dealing in grace with this if-then system. And that's what we're going to see tonight. If I shut up heaven, then here's the way. Keep this passage and go to Daniel chapter 9. You want to see this thing at work? <coughs> you go to Daniel chapter 9. If you, if you read through that thing in Leviticus chapter 26, you see that there are levels of judgment. I'm going to do this to you. If you don't repent, I'm going to do this to you. If you don't repent then, I'm going to do... Well, one of the, the ultimate penalties was you'll be taken captive of your enemies. And I'll just send you away... Uh, at the hands of the Gentiles. Well, in the book of Daniel, that's what has happened to Israel. They've been taken captive of their enemies. They've been sent away. And Daniel is a believing Jew in the midst of a nation in captivity for their sin. That's what Daniel is. And look at Daniel 9, what he does. Verse 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, saying that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Daniel says, I began to understand that as a punishment, as a curse, for our lack of performance, we were going to be taken captive 70 years. And Daniel begins to count the years. And he says, ooh, the time's almost up. We're about ready to get out of jail. Now, if you're getting ready to get out of jail, what you want to do is fix the things that got you there in the first place so you don't end up back there again right after you get out. So Daniel starts to do that. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. Now listen, you've got to look at these two verses together. Daniel 9, 3 and 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Look at what Daniel does. I set my face unto the Lord God. I set my face to seek His face. You know what 2 Chronicles 7.14 tells them to do? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. That's what Daniel did. I set my face unto the Lord God. Look at what else Daniel did. To seek by prayer and supplications. They have to humble themselves and 
pray and seek my face. What else did Daniel do? Not only did he do it in prayer and supplications, but he did it with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Humble yourselves. Isn't that what fasting and sackcloth and ashes are? Signs of humility and humbleness and unworthiness and all the rest? See, that verse is what Daniel's doing. You can see Daniel fulfill 2 Chronicles 7.14 in Daniel chapter 9. And you know something else? King Solomon said, Mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. But Daniel wasn't in that place, was he? He was in Babylon. But you know what Daniel did? Daniel opened his windows and he looked to that place, didn't he? And that's what got him in trouble. See, Daniel didn't just open those windows and pray toward Jerusalem so that everybody could see him up there praying. Daniel opened those windows and prayed toward Jerusalem because Daniel knew that that's where God was. And if there was any hope for the nation, somehow there had to be a prayer of confession and contrition and, and, uh, and supplication made to that God that dwells between the cherubim down there in Jerusalem. And that's what Daniel's setting out to do. So you can see it spelled out. You and I, we're going to see this as we go on. First of all, you don't have a, your God isn't over there between the cherubim to pray to. All right? And all this stuff about the humbleness and the humility and the sackcloth and the ashes and beating yourself up. We're going to see in a little while why all that stuff needs to be kept where it was back here. Not put out here. Matthew chapter 3. Just to demonstrate to you that <coughs> that message goes right on. John the Baptist comes, and he begins to the preach to the nation Israel in Matthew chapter number 3. And he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, verse number 1 of Matthew 3, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to the baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. John the Baptist comes. And he tells that nation, you better do what Daniel did back there. You better repent, you better confess, and you better bring forth fruits. We didn't read the whole passage back there, but as Daniel begins to pray, he says, Oh Lord, we have sinned great sin against Thee. He says he made his confession on behalf of the nation. And he confesses. And Matthew chapter 3, the message comes, repent, confess, Get right. So there's a system here of performance. And if you don't perform, you're going to get a curse. And if you get under the curse, there's got to be a system of sacrifice and repentance in order to get you right with God again. So you're living in a system where you might be blessed, you might be cursed. If you're blessed, it's because of the way you're performing. If you're cursed, it's because of the way you're performing. And there's a remedy for that bad performance back here, and that's to perform something else in the way of sacrifice and repentance in order to get back to a point where God can bless you and get back to a point where you can begin to try to fulfill this if part of the law again. Now, that's the way God's dealing with the nation Israel. And the issue there always is the performance of the flesh and what you can see. The performance had to be what you could see. The blessing was something you could see. The cursing was something you see. The sacrifice was something you could see. The repentance had to be... Daniel repented in sackcloth and ashes. He made a show of it. Uh, the, the, the curse that had come upon Israel in Daniel's day was that they were captive in the nation. There was no doubt about whether the curse was there. They had failed to perform the way God wanted them to perform, and that's why they were there. See, it's all dealing with 
the flesh and what you can see and the physical program and what God's doing with the flesh. But then, some things begin to change. Well, first, go with me to Leviticus 23 and Hebrews 10. Leviticus 23 and Hebrews 10. Why all this? Why all this stuff you can see? Why all this... This goings on about, you know, sackcloth and ashes and repenting and wailing and bawling and squalling and moaning and groaning. And why, why all that stuff? Because God was doing something with the nation. Look at Leviticus 23. This is, this is interesting to me. And have any of you in here ever, ever have in the past or maybe now observed a religious holiday called Lent where you're supposed to have some time. You can raise your hand. It's all right. I used to, you know, think, oh, Lent, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. I used to do that. And you know what the whole point of that is? It's to give you a time just to feel bad about yourself, isn't it? Just to feel sorry because you're such a rotten, sinful, lousy, moth-eaten, maggot-infested wretch. That's what you are. Look at Leviticus. You want to see Lent? Look at Leviticus 23. On the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you. Ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. So, the day of atonement. He's. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't tell you the verse. You mean you don't have it memorized? Oh. Well, I'm sorry. Verse 27 and 28. Yeah. See, Ron knows. Yeah. You're a faithful brother. I like you. Yeah. <laughs> Leviticus, Leviticus 23, 27 and 28. Okay, so on the Day of Atonement, we know what's going on there. We read it in Leviticus 16. The high priest is in making the sacrifice. Right? Well, what am I doing? Just a common, average, ordinary Jew, you know, John Joe Jew out here walking down the street. What am I going to do? Well... Verse 28, verse 29, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day shall be cut off from among his people. Notice what he had said in verse 27, Ye shall afflict your souls. Do you know what God did for Israel? He gave them a day when all they got to do was sit around home, no work, Just sit in the house, it's a Sabbath day, and think, boy, I'm really a mess. I'm such a sinner. I just don't know if I can go on another day. I'm going to afflict my soul. I'm going to beat up on myself. Oh, God, what a... Oh, I'm such a wretch! Do you know any believers that act like that today? That sort of get a guilt trip about things? God set a day aside for Israel to do that. And you know what it did? Look in Hebrews chapter 10. You know what it did? For the law, verse 1. Hebrews 10, 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But, in those sacrifices, in that day of atonement, and in what Israel did on that day, and all the other sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. You know what the point is? Look at your flesh. Examine it. Think about it. Meditate upon it. And realize how bad it is. There's a remembrance made again for sins every year. The law was given that all the world might become guilty. And it made you guilty by pointing you to your flesh and showing you what it was. And listen to this. Any system today, whether it's called Christian psychology, or whether it's called counseling, 
or whether it's called anything else that encourages you to analyze your flesh and decide why you did it, where you did it, when you did it, how often you did it, you know, am I going to do it again, is legalism. Because that's what the law did. It looked at your flesh, it analyzed your flesh, and it kicked it. Reject. And any system today that tries to do that is just putting you back under the bondage of the law. You, have, you hear the average Christian counselor or Christian psychologist on the radio or television, you know what they tell you to do? You take the thing you did, oh, it's terrible. And you look at it from this side. Well, how do you feel about this? And then you come over here and say, well, what's your input about this? And then you get somebody from over here to say, well, what is your deepest feeling about this? Hey, you know what it, you know what it is? God calls it sin. <gasps> How do you feel about sin? Well, I don't like it. There's your Christian psychology lesson 101. <laughs> what you do is sin. God don't like it. What do you do about that? Quit. <laughs> then God will be happy. Well, we're going to get into that. Just no, Let's get ahead. Understand that, this, that putting in this legalism, giving you a constant remembrance of sin can be a very subtle thing. But I'm going to say again, and you need to watch for this, any system that encourages you to analyze your flesh and why you do the things you do. Oh, I was the firstborn, and my wife was the middle child, and that means that she feels this way about me, and I feel that way about her, and, and that causes problems here. And then, you know, my mama one time said that my nose was crooked, and that makes this over here. And that. No, 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 no. That's not why all that stuff happens. The law demonstrated why all that stuff happens. Because you're sinful. And it gave you a consciousness of sins. But look at what Hebrews says. It says, those sacrifices couldn't make the comers perfect. For then, if there had been a sacrifice that could make the comers perfect, they would have ceased to be offered. Because if the guy that brought the sacrifice is now perfect, he's never going to have to bring one again, is he? And because... The worshipers, the worshipers are going to know this. Once purged, once they're made perfect, would have no more conscience of sins. They wouldn't dwell on it. They wouldn't focus on it. They wouldn't meditate on it. They wouldn't try to decide why they did it. They wouldn't go to Christian psychologists and give them 100 bucks an hour to tell them why they did it. They'd say, it's gone. Sin is gone doesn't dwell in me anymore because I've been made perfect so if we could only find a perfect sacrifice where would we go to find a, per a perfect sacrifice Let me see. perfect sacrifice can't be blood of bulls and goats because Hebrews tells you that won't cut it couldn't be any man because they're just like all the rest of us I think Paul talked about a guy didn't he it was a pretty good guy. Look in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter number 3. Paul gives you the answer to the thing. He says, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, hey, we know that. That's what the law showed us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then look at verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, to be a satisfaction, that word means, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Oh, yeah. There is a perfect sacrifice, isn't there? There is one that satisfies completely. There is one that God totally... There is one that God looks at that sacrifice and He says, I am satisfied. I accept it. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He did it in obedience to me. And I honor my word by accepting that sacrifice. 
Now, if there was just a way that I could be a part of it. Look at Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Well, there is a by faith. Look back up in chapter 3, verse number 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law. Boy, that's what I need. I need to get righteous without that law because I can't get it without law. All that does is get me a curse and then I've got to go repent and sacrifice. Then I go out and do it again. Then I go do it again and, I go, and spend all my time out there sinning and then going to repent of my sin. And I don't get anything else done but sin and repent. Sin and repent. So I need some righteousness without the law. Verse 22 says, I can have the righteousness of God which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's offered unto all, and it comes upon all them that believe. All i got to do is believe. And when I simply believe, God Almighty takes that righteousness of Jesus Christ, and He reckons it to my account. <coughs> and you know what He does? This performance... comes acceptance. Accepted in the beloved. God doesn't put you under an if-then performance system today. He puts you under an acceptance system based on the fact that He is satisfied with Christ. And your acceptance before God and understand that this is the most important thing that you can understand in your Christian life after you're saved, your acceptance before God is never, ever, 